bit of a learning curve. Um, welcome to Lisa Cooper, who's going to talk about the Salt Haven Wildlife Rehabilitation Program. Um, we are really happy to have these guys here in the middle of February. Because um, <laughs> you never know if you're going to get here, right? <laughs> anyway, tonight's great. Um, there is a donation box at the back that will help cover costs if anyone would need. If anybody has some extra coin. Um, what's our next meeting about? <laughs> <laughs> Madeline Sant 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 Thank you, Bob. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can turn the lights down here. Okay. Hang on. How's that? Yep, I can still see. Can everybody see the screen okay? Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, great. Okay. So as Rod has already introduced me, my name is Lisa Cooper. Um, and just bear with me while I uh, share. There we go. Sorry, no, I'm sorry. Um, I'm a former volunteer at Salt Haven. Um, I was there for over 15 years, along with my two daughters, uh, my husband and my sister. Salt Haven became a family affair. So, there we go. I do need to let you know, uh, before we get rolling with the pictures, that some of the slides might be upsetting or disturbing to some people. And so I put a little warning in each time before one of those sh is going to come up. Okay, just so you know. Okay, um, basics. What is Salt Haven? Where is Salt Haven and how am I involved? Salt Haven is located near Strathroy, Ontario, which is midway between Sarnia and London. Um, it was created in 2004 by Brian Salt as a formalized extension of his lifelong passion for helping wildlife. Salt Haven actually started many years previously in the 1990s with just two volunteers. They administered to the needs of fewer than 50 animals in a year. Fast forward to the present. On a busy summer day, Salt Haven receives 150 phone calls per day for sick, injured, or orphaned wild animals. Each spring, 120 new volunteers are taught how to care for the needs of over 3,000 wild animals that find their way to Salt Haven's clinic in both Mount Bridges, Ontario, and Salt Haven West, which is in Regina, Saskatchewan. I was a clinic volunteer for over 15 years, along with being the volunteer coordinator for several years and organizing fundraisers. What began as a one-room clinic in a chicken coop, and it literally was a chicken coop at one time, um, with everything in close quarters, has evolved. Hmm. Heather, can you help me out? Okay. has evolved into a 1,600-square-foot building. Um, there we go. 1,600-square-foot building um, with dedicated rooms for triage, uh, an avian room, which is birds, um, mammal care, an isolation room, a room for bats to overwinter, a laundry room, there we go, and a food prep room. There are also multiple outdoor enclosed areas for our raptors. There we go. Um, and raptors are birds of prey, falcon, hawks, owls, kestrels. Um, so we have a number of, um, we call them ambassadors. And so these are our raptors that we have on site, and I'll tell you a little bit about each one. So Shikoba, sorry. Shikoba is a red-tailed hawk who was bred in captivity. Shikar is a lighter falcon who is native to India. And Spirit 
is a one-winged, one-eyed American bald eagle who was rescued after becoming entangled in a power line. Brian had to get special permission from the Ministry of Natural Resources to be able to keep Spirit as an ambassador bird. Otherwise, he would have been euthanized. Uh, there are also squirrel release pens, uh, pens for recovering raptors. Um, and a community garden. Salt Haven is run by two full-time staff members, several part-time administrative and media people, and our director, Brian Salt. And I really wanted Brian to be here tonight, but he is in Calgary right now visiting family. Um, the rest of the work is carried out by an army of volunteers who commit to a minimum of eight hours a week throughout the summer months. The clinic itself operates seven days a week in the spring and summer months with three shifts running each day. As the season slows down after Thanksgiving, fewer volunteers are required working shorter shifts. Over the winter, they have a special bat squad who looks after any bats that come in during the cold months and are later released in the spring. These bats would otherwise perish if they were left out in the cold weather. I was just speaking with Brian recently and he told me that they now have a new enclosed area called the Bat Bungalow. This is an outdoor mesh enclosure which allows the bats to hunt insects in order to build up their strength and to hone their hunting skills. Come spring, lights are turned on at night to attract the bugs. The bats are let out into the mesh enclosure and they spend the night eating to their heart's content. There's another specialized group of volunteers who take care of the raptors. Salt Haven volunteers spend their four hour shifts cleaning cages, which involves a lot of poop and subsequent laundry, doing food prep and washing dishes, feeding mammals and birds, sometimes every 20 minutes, and anything else that is asked of them. A number of volunteers use the experience that they gain at Salt Haven to apply to veterinarian school. We are proud to say that there are currently eight vets in Ontario who started their career as a Salt Haven volunteer. Salt Haven also relies on skilled tradespeople and handy people such as electrician, carpenters and plumbers who are an essential part of the work of the creative maintenance crew. The main purpose of Salt Haven is twofold. The first, as I've just described, is to provide care for injured orphan or injured or sorry, injured or orphaned wildlife. This may involve animals who have been hit by vehicles on the road. This isn't a gross one. Um, orphan birds and mammals whose parents have either been killed or driven off by human interaction, baby birds found on the ground after a windstorm, um, or animals that have been caught and or injured by our cats, uh, cats and dogs that roam free. The next picture is a little bit perhaps unsettling. Um, there, this is a picture that's coming up. It's a baby bunny who was caught by a dog or a cat and has lost some of the fur and tissue on its hind end. Uh, we refer to this as degloving. And generally speaking, this is, it will heal. It's fairly easy to treat, but it's also avoidable. Um, by law, Salt Haven is not allowed to keep uh, is only allowed to take in animals which they feel can be treated and then successfully released back to the wild. Thus their motto, healed, released, and free. Any other animal that doesn't meet these criteria is either not admitted or, if injured, is humanely euthanized by the team of trainers. The other important part of Salt Haven <coughs> excuse me, is to educate people about how they can live with wildlife without impacting them negatively. negatively. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about how we can help wildlife. By maintaining natural outdoor areas as wild space where birds and animals can find shelter and food throughout the year. Being aware when cutting down trees, are there bird's nests or cavities that might contain baby birds or squirrels? This is especially important in the spring and early summer. When hiring an arborist, maybe ask them if they check for nests first. Cleaning bird feeders regularly and properly don't feed wildlife other than your bird feeder, and don't kidnap babies, and we'll talk more on that later. The effect of free roaming dogs and cats on wildlife, the danger of fishing line, fishing hooks, and threads off of towels, 
being aware that Halloween decorations, such as plastic spider webs and some Christmas decorations, can pose a risk to birds and bats who may get entangled. Trying to decrease window strikes by birds. Not discarding empty drink containers with plastic lids, especially those that have an open end. Not installing wrought iron fencing with spikes on top. Not using fireworks. It scares not only wildlife, but it scares our pets too, and it's bad for the environment. And the dangers of using rodenticides, which are rat poison, um, to control rodent populations. Let's drill down on a few of these topics. Helping a lost um, baby bird or animal or accidentally kidnapping. You find a small bird on the ground. It has feathers, but it doesn't seem to be able to fly very well. What do you do? More importantly, what don't you do? It's probably a fledgling, a young bird that is learning to fly, but isn't quite a professional yet. Generally speaking, the adult parent stays around and will come down and feed the young one throughout the day. The best thing to do is, if it's out in the open, to move it to a nearby sheltered spot, like a bush, to protect it from predators, like your neighbor's outdoor cat. Unless it's injured, it will probably be able to fly up to a low branch in a few days. However, if that baby bird doesn't have any feathers, or very few, and if you can safely reach the nest that it came out of, try to put it back in the nest. It's an urban myth that you shouldn't touch a baby animal or else its parents will abandon it. If you ever come across a baby mammal, never give it milk, fluids, or food of any kind unless advised by a wildlife rehabilitator. Giving them the wrong food or liquid could cause irreversible damage to their systems and possibly kill them. What do you do if you find a nest of baby bunnies? Rabbits sometimes make their nests in rather unusual spots, one of which might be in the middle of your yard. They are often well concealed in a small indentation in the ground, lined with soft rabbit hair and covered with grass. Although you or I might not see it, the keen nose of your dog or cat will easily sniff them out and can make short work of a nest of baby bunnies. If you discover a nest and have a dog or outdoor cat, try to keep your pet away from the nest until the bunnies are ready to leave. This is generally about three weeks. In the meantime, place an upside down laundry basket or a blue box with a weight on top over the nest during the day. The rabbits will come back to the nest two or three times a day to feed their young, often at night. Uh, remove the basket at dusk after your pets are in for the night to allow the mother to come back to the nest to feed. What do you do if you come across a fawn? Sorry. There we go. Coming across a fawn tucked under a large bush or in deep grass is a once in a lifetime experience to be savored. However, never assume that the fawn has been abandoned by its mother. When a baby deer is born, it has no scent, but the mother does. In order to protect her young from predators, she leaves it in what she thinks is a safe, safe location while she goes off for extended periods of time, often only returning two to five times a day to feed the fawn. Most fawns that Salt Haven received calls about are actually not abandoned and don't require intervention. Just as an aside, keeping wildlife as pets is against the law. Wild animals are subject to federal and provincial wildlife regulations. In most provinces, including Ontario and Quebec, it is illegal to keep any wildlife as a pet without a permit or special license. Not only is it dangerous to yourself, once you decide that you can no longer keep the animal for whatever reason, releasing them back into the wild is basically a death sentence, as they are not able to find their own food, and even worse, they've learned to associate humans as a source of food and will approach people that they encounter. Um, next, we're going to talk about the use of rodenticides. Everybody knows that's rat poison. It comes in powder or different forms. Um, and this was, uh, the interesting information is taken from an article that was written by a salt human trainer. Rats, mice, squirrels, and even raccoons can sometimes be pesky and cause damage to our homes. One of the easiest and cheapest ways to get rid of rodents in residential and agricultural settings is by using anticoagulant rodenticides, such as warfarin. These products can easily be placed in our homes, barns, and yards where rodents will ingest them. The affected animal then wanders back outside and will never bother us again. 
This pest control method can almost be more damaging to our environment as a whole, since it can affect the species that we re rely on to naturally control rodent populations, predatory birds. Unfortunately, these poisons kill more than just their target. They also kill anything that may eat the sick rodent, including dogs and cats. How rodenticides work after being ingested is that the chemicals cause the animal to internally bleed to death. But before they die, they become an easier target for predatory animals, such as owls, red-tailed hawks, and others. When predatory birds ingest any rodent that's been infected by a rodenticide, the raptor's health is at risk. This is known as secondary rodenticide. Owls and hawks play crucial roles within our local ecosystems. In fact, one raptor can eat a thousand rodents per year, and a family of screech owls will eat 12 mice per day. Each of them has a responsibility in controlling prey animal populations. By interfering with the natural me mechanisms within our ecosystems, we often do more harm than good. Humans may think they are contribu contributing to population control when they use various rodenticides but in reality, it is just dis disrupting the food chain and directly harming those who help control it. There is nothing sadder than seeing a beautiful bird like this owl, um, who is reduced to being unable to even stand on its own. The chemical reaction that is meant to kill the mouse or rat has the same effect on the bird, cat, or any other animal who eats it. Aside from predatory birds, rodenticides can also be detrimental to other species and even children or family pets. With so many other species at risk of exposure to rodenticides, are they truly worth using? The key to preventing non-target animals from coming into contact with rodenticides is by being proactive and taking the necessary measures to reduce attraction and accessibility to the home, as well as avoiding the use of rodenticides altogether. In cases with suspected secondary rodenticide, vitamin K is administered in the hopes of promoting clotting to stop the internal bleeding. Fluids are also given if the animal is found to be dehydrated. As a community, there are various ways we can help contribute to the conservation of wildlife and present such, prevent such tragedies that occur. The first is educating others on the effects of rodenticides, their mechanisms of action, and other alternatives to rodent population control. We are going to now touch on nuisance animals. As much as most of us love living amongst nature's creatures, sometimes they become unwelcome guests. It is important to consider the source of what is attracting the unwanted critters, whether it's skunks, raccoons, or even flying squirrels. For example, around the home, whether it's garbage, compost, bird seed, recycling, or things in the yard, these are all seen as food sources for wildlife. So keeping these secure will limit attraction and reduce the requirement of any sort of intervention. We can also seal openings around the home to prevent unwanted guests from entering access points, as some can squeeze through openings the size of a dime, particularly bats. Live traps, non-lethal deterrents such as cayenne pepper and peppermint soap, and humane snap traps can limit non-target animals from being harmed. However, trapping and removing adult nuisance animals in the spring can lead to a nest of dead babies when their parent doesn't return to feed them. A better approach is to try and make the nesting area inhospitable for the animal. Loud noise or music, bright lights, or the scent from a well-used dog blanket may act as enough of a deterrent to encourage her to move the babies to another site. Once she has vacated the nest with all of her young, close up any openings that may be used again by another animal. If you find a nest of baby skunks, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't advance that. That was the raccoon. That was on my own deck, and it's because I had left my bird feeder out. So, yeah. Um, if you find a nest of baby skunks, they're so cute. <laughs> um, under your porch or shed in the spring, just leave them alone. They are nocturnal animals, so you probably won't encounter them during the day, and after about eight weeks, the young will be ready to leave the den. Once the den has been vacated, close off the excess to prevent the same thing from happening next spring. Uh, the effect of free-roaming dogs and cats on wildlife. 
I know this is a hard <coughs> sell, as many people feel that cats and sometimes even dogs should be allowed to roam free. And up until my current pet, my cats were always outdoor cats. However, recent findings from a new study has found that cats roaming free prey upon almost any animal, be it reptile, insect, or amphibian. Their hunting is so prolific and so successful that it poses a legitimate threat to global biodiversity. What's shocking is just the indiscriminate nature of their hunting, said Christopher Lepchik, who was the paper's lead author. The paper published in Nature Communications found that domestic and feral roaming cats will hunt or scavenge more than 2,000 species. Almost half of the victims were birds, followed by reptiles and mammals. The author also said they also found a surprising number of insects, including emperor dragonflies and endangered monarch butterflies. Their menu <coughs> includes nearly 350 species that are threatened, vulnerable, or endangered, including the little brown bat. I can attest to the fact that my cat is quite happy being an indoor cat. Um, she stays safe and free from disease and doesn't get the opportunity to kill other critters or become a meal herself. Bird feeders. Um, many of us enjoy feeding and watching birds and other critters that come to our feeders. Both my cat and I spend a lot of time in the winter looking out at the chickadees, nuthatches, and blue jays. An active feeder is an eye-opener into avian society, and observing the pecking order of the various feathered visitors is always a captivating experience. <coughs> a busy feeder has its own issues of spilled seed and bird droppings that many of us leave to clean up once the snow has disappeared. Therein lies the problem in that a disease called avian conjunct conjunctivitis can percolate and spread to the very visitors that we are trying to attract. Avian conjunctivitis is a bacterial infection in the eye that can infect many species of songbird, but quite often is seen in house finches. Um, the bacteria affect the conjunctivitis, the membrane surrounding the eyes, causing the tissue to swell and become irritated. As the infection spreads, the bird can become completely blind. Due to not being able to find food, starvation quickly follows if not treated. Signs of infection are swollen, red eyes, listlessness, and approachability. Birds will often sit with their feathers fluffed as their energy reserves diminish. At Salt Haven, we have had success in treating infected birds with topical and oral antibiotics. Conjunctivitis is a zoonotic disease, meaning that it can spread to humans. It is important to note that you should wear gloves when handling the bird to prevent contamination to yourself. There are a few simple steps that you can take to help reduce the spread of this disease that seems to be more prevalent in the spring and winter. Cleaning up spilled and rotting bird seed under your feeders, along with the associated bird droppings, will help to curtail the growth and spread of the bacteria. Because this disease can spread to humans, it is important to follow precautions like wearing gloves and even masks to prevent inhaling the dust. Wash up well with soap and water afterwards. Allowing your feeder to totally empty before you refill it. Take the feeder inside to clean it with a solution of one part bleach to ten parts water. Then rinse well and allow the feeder to dry completely before you refill it. Cleaning your feeder once a month is ideal, but more often if you have a busy feeder. Move your feeder to a different location in the yard, away from the location of the previous site. This helps spread around, this helps spread around where spilled seed accumulates. Clean up the old location so that seed and droppings don't rot over the spring and summer. A general feeder tip is to not place the feeder near a south-facing window of your home. Birds see the reflected sky and will fly towards it, hitting your window. Window strikes kill many birds in this situation. And this part came as a surprise to me. A feeder placed closer to the window rather than further away is better because birds leaving the feeder can't build up much speed if they do happen to hit your window. With a little simple maintenance and some good hygiene, you can make your backyard feeder a happy, safe place for birds and a great source of entertainment year-round. Window strikes. 
The views along both Lake Huron and Georgian Bay are absolutely stunning, and many of us have houses with large picture windows so we can appreciate this beautiful part of the province that we live in. Unfortunately, these large picture windows pose a danger to our local bird population, especially during migration. It is estimated that one billion birds a year die from collisions with buildings in North America. How can we help? Make your windows visible to the birds. And I feel like I'm doing a commercial plug here, but I'm not. Um, this is a product called Feather Friendly Window Markers, and it's one of the most effective and affordable solutions. It's a sticky adhesive with tiny dots, um, and you put it on your window, and uh, it's available at either Lee Valley or online. I actually have a box if anybody wants to look at it later. <coughs> Another suggestion is when purchasing new or replacement windows, look for ones that have a full screen on the outside. That way, if a bird hits the screen, it tends to bounce off <clears throat> rather than incur damage to itself. If you hear a bird hit your window and you find it on the ground stunned, carefully place it in a lidded container in which air holes have been punched. Place the container in a quiet, dark spot for about an hour. After an hour, take the container back outside and gently remove the lid. Often this time in quiet isolation is enough to allow the bird to recover. Okay. okay. Ornamental iron fencing. This is like the worst, the worst picture, so I'll just be on it real quick, okay? Um, ornate iron fencing with spikes on top may look very impressive, but it can be a death sentence to a deer who tries to jump over it. There is a large cemetery in London with just this type of fencing, and on more than one occasion, a call has gone out to rescue a deer who has impaled itself on top of the spikes. Usually the animal has to be euthanized because, as you can imagine, the internal damage is generally irreparable. When considering this type of fencing, um, please think about a more animal-friendly version. Um, and at a lower height, perhaps. So even just something like standard chain link, it's not as pretty and impressive, but but it would save lives. Okay. Fishing line hooks and beach towel string. Often when people are fishing, they leave fishing line and hooks on the ground and in the water. And not always intentionally, I know it's, you know. This creates a dangerous situation for wildfowl and turtles as they become entangled in the line or end up with a fishing hook embedded in its mouth. If left untended, this can lead to a slow, painful death. Fishing hooks are an increasingly common threat to turtles, and the Ontario Turtle Conservation Centre staff, along with others working with turtles, have removed many hooks from various species over the years. Hooks can prevent proper feeding and digestion, they can rupture organs, and their presence can lead to life-threatening infection, so having them removed quickly is vitally important. There is also danger from string from beach towels or kites and or strings off of toys. This is actually a Canada goose who's had string wrapped around its leg for enough time that it's cutting into the flesh, and then eventually the flesh will grow back around that injury. Um, but it's not a good thing in the first place. So when you're outdoors, please don't leave debris behind and keep a bag on hand to collect garbage that others have left behind. On another note, before discarding empty jars, such as peanut butter, always put the lid back on. This prevents a hungry or curious animal from getting its head stuck in an empty jar. These are another of my pet peeves. Left like this, these are a death trap for anything that happens to get its neck or body through one of these openings. Whenever I come across um, these plastic rings, I make sure to cut them into smaller pieces without any enclosed openings. The picture on the right, yeah, you're right, is a new type of six pack holder that is actually edible, or at least it will disintegrate. in our local turtle population. Uh, there are eight native species of turtles that call Ontario home. Even more surprising is that all eight of our freshwater turtles have been designated as either at risk, either federally, provincially, or both. 
Here on the Bruce Peninsula, we see mainly painted turtles um, and snapping turtles, especially during nesting season, which runs mid-May to early July. Turtles have suffered considerable losses due to human-caused threats. Some of these threats can include habitat loss, um, artificial manipulation of water flows, pollution, <laughs> collection as exotic pets, the introduction of invasive plants, and being run over by vehicles, to name a few. Uh, this little guy has a cracked shell, obviously, and uh, what they've done is they bonded plastic zip ties to the shell to give it a chance to heal, and those will stay on until the shell has repaired itself, and then he can be released again. We've probably all come across a turtle trying to get across busy Highway 6 or any other road, for that matter. They prefer to dig their nests along the gravel shoulders of the road. Snapping turtles take up to 15 to 20 years before they start laying eggs. So you can imagine the impact on their population numbers when even one turtle is killed by a passing vehicle. How can you help? When it's safe to do so, move the turtle in the direction it is going. Never pick it up or move a turtle by its tail. Their tail is an extension of their spinal column, and so you can easily cause serious injury by using your tail to move them. Nor should you place your hands too close to the front of the shell, as they have a fairly long reach. Uh, use a shovel or a car mat that you slide under them from the back, then drag the mat or shovel um, to the side of the road that they were headed to. If you're comfortable picking it up, do so only at the four and seven o'clock positions of its shell. Since snapping turtles are not able to pull their heads or limbs back in, into their shells like other turtles, their only defense is to snap, and they have a fairly flexible neck with a long reach. By the way, I can tell you from experience that when you pick up a snapping turtle to move it, it will pee all over your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and they're really heavy. <laughs> the Bruce Peninsula National Park has a program called Turtle Trackers, uh, where a group of volunteers who look for turtle nesting sites within the park during the busy egg laying period. Each nest we find is covered with a wooden framed box covered in wire that has a small opening. There we go. Some of you may have seen them along your roads or other areas. The box prevents predators like raccoons or foxes from digging up the eggs, and the small opening at the side allows the hatchlings to leave the box and get back to the water safely. We tag and log each nest box we place, and in the late summer and early fall, we go back to check to see if there have been any hatchlings and to remove the nesting boxes. So you can see that even though we've already placed a nest box in one area, they must like that area because another one has come along and is also digging and laying eggs. Climate change. In 2023, more than 18.4 million hectares burned across Canada. This shattered the previous single year high mark of 7.1 million hectares, which was set in 1995. The greenhouse gases these wildfires have released are estimated to make up more than one quarter of the world's total emissions for the year. For the past 12,000 years since glaciation, forests in Canada have evolved their resident plants and creatures adapting to and even benefiting from periodic burns. But as wildfires increase in frequency and severity, Scientists wonder whether forest ecosystems will reach a tipping point at which even fire-adapted wildlife will not be able to cope. In early January of this year, Salthaven received several calls about a pair of Canada geese and five goslings that had been spotted around University Hospital in London. Goslings in January? What the heck? Eventually, the five became only two as predators and a vehicle took its toll. Salt Haven stepped in and was able to capture the two goslings, um, but only one of the parents. They were able to catch only one of the parents. Since Canada geese mate for life, um, it was decided that the best course of action was to release the one adult so it could remain with its mate, and the two goslings were taken back to Salt Haven where they will be taken care of until they can be released back into the wild this spring. This picture, there. 
This picture was taken a couple weeks ago of the same two goslings um, that were brought in, and you can see how quickly they grow. So why bother? Why bother trying to protect wildlife, birds, and reptiles? Protecting wildlife is essential essential for maintaining the balance of nature and for preserving our environment for future generations. Every species on this planet plays an important role as part of the natural cycle of life, so it's important that we take action to conserve wildlife. To help protect wildlife, it's important to understand how species interact within their ecosystems and how they're affected by environmental and human influences. When we negatively impact one species through human interaction, we cause a ripple effect that impacts other species. From a more practical point of view, protected areas that support thriving wildlife populations generate revenue through tourism, creating local jobs, and fostering economic growth. Moreover, maintaining healthy ecosystems enables sustainable harvesting <coughs> of resources such as fish, timber, and non-timber forest products. I hope I've been able to highlight some of the good work that Salt Haven does and offer a few tips on how we can better learn to live with local wildlife and bird populations. Salt Haven's public education programs focus on introducing people to the uniqueness and diversity of Ontario wildlife and the work that Salt Haven does to help sick, injured, or orphaned wild animals. We feel strongly that people of all ages can be inspired to develop a lasting passion for improving their environment. Salt Haven is proud to have a strong tradition of making connections between people and wildlife. Um, if you visit their website, and I have the link later on, there are a number of helpful videos and information um, in the event of finding an injured or orphaned animal. Unfortunately, there aren't any local wildlife rehabilitators up in this area, so we often just have to do the best we can with the knowledge and the resources that we have. I have a handout at the front here that has a list of organizations um, that provides these kinds of services if anyone is interested. Salt Haven relies on support from individuals, businesses, foundations, and fundraisers to carry out their work. They strive to promote the well-being of wildlife and their habitats through rehabilitation of sick, injured, and orphaned wildlife and through public education programs. Thank you for inviting me here to speak tonight. I wish Brian could have been here himself, but perhaps another time. I'll finish up with just a few more cute slides of some of my favorites. This is a <laughs> chipmunk. Um, and we feed them with these little tiny syringes that are, uh, we load with the right amount of formula, and that's based on their weight. They get 5% of their body weight. And usually it's every, about every two hours, I think. Um, hummingbird. Being able to, to see a hummingbird up close is just such a, a thrill. And uh, so it's got a little tiny eyedropper and there's nectar in there. Um, baby morning dove. And so we try to simulate um, how it would feed from its mother by putting its beak into her mouth and down into the crop to get crop milk or seed. So that's what that red thing is. Uh, baby blue jay. They are just, they've got the most character. Um, he's getting fed a cricket. Um, so we feed some of the birds crickets, uh, mealworms, um, fruit, yeah, and seed. And that's, yeah. My little favorite and they don't stink when they're little because they can't spray so they're just really cute <laughs> Whoops, it is. all right i think i went too far but um anyways does anybody have any questions yeah. <laughs> were you to find a uh let's say a bird hits the window or the car and it was, i think maybe the wing is broken yeah um do we call you and somehow get it there? <laughs> no, I wish I wish I I had um, was able to to help things up here, um, but there really isn't anybody. What you can do is take a sheet and then just try to find uh, the closest one, which isn't close. Um, there's Guelph. Mm -hmm. There's um, there might be something in Barrie. 
Um, what I've done before with another lady that I've met who lives up in Tobermory is we will, she'll get a call about an injured bird and then we'll drive it halfway down and then we've made arrangements with say Salt Haven and they'll send somebody halfway up and then we just pass it along. But there isn't anything, yeah, there isn't anything close by. It would need to have a wing wrap and then that would have to be left on if in fact the wing was broken. Um, left on for a period of weeks and then released again. And their bones are hollow, so they actually can heal fairly well. It's just that it has to have the right, you know, and pain meds and, and stuff like that. So, yeah. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there a percentage of, of veterinarians that also look after wildlife? Or is that what you've got on the list that you're going to... Uh, that's wildlife rehabilitators. That's May. I mean, if you have a vet around then and you had an animal, you can always call them and ask them, even if it's just to euthanize. Because to me, that's at least doing something to get it out of its misery, right? Mm -hmm. If it's a bird with a broken wing or something that, you know, that we can't do anything for just because we don't have the resources, a vet at least might euthanize it for you. And I did talk to the vet down in Wyerton uh, once about turtles and he said yeah he if he if he was asked to he could euthanize a turtle. Yeah. So sometimes that's you know the most humane solution we can offer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. How long was it for the baby skunks before they spray? Oh before they spray? <laughs> well we usually released them around four to six weeks and they weren't spraying them. So they're kind of getting ready when they get mad and they're trying to kind of let you know that they're not happy, they'll stamp their feet. So if you see a, a, a skunk doing that, then it's like, okay, I'll just back off. Yeah. But once they have sprayed, um, they can't do it again for a while and that's their defense. So they're only gonna spray if they feel really threatened. So, you know. Anybody else? Yes. In terms of turtle rehabilitation, do you guys take care of most of them on site or do you work with the site in Peterborough quite often and their turtle program there? Uh, yeah, that would be the closest if there was an injured turtle. Um, that would be the closest where it would have to go. Yeah, they do keep them down at Salt Haven when we get them in, but even sometimes then they're beyond what they can help. So then again, we do like a car shuttle to get them up to Peterborough. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Yes, Rob. How is Salt Haven supported? I know um, there's a lot of volunteers, but... Yeah, donations. Um, they get some grants sometimes, like trillium grants. Um, but the majority of it is through donations and fundraising. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. And Brian has basically dedicated his life to, to doing this. Um, it's a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week job. Like, we can't just say, oh, sorry, I'm going away this weekend, so I can't you know, look after this. And, and they do have volunteers and two paid full-time staff who will step in and help. But uh, it's, it's a commitment. It's a lifetime commitment. So, What yeah. would be your average time that you would keep an animal? I, I, okay, uh, a raptor, like a hawk. Um, until what they will do is they'll get it in and assess it to see what the issue is. I mean, if it's a broken bone or whatever, then obviously they'll keep it until it's it's healed or uh, rodenticide rat poisoning. Um, but then once it's getting to the point where they feel that it's almost ready to release, they test fly it. So they put um, what they call jesses on its leg, which is a leather um, strap. And then they test fly it to, to help it build up its muscles in its chest. And then they will... Oops, um, also let it practice hunting. So in its uh, pen, they'll put like a wading pool with no water in it and they'll put some live mice in there. And then they make sure that the animal can hunt on its own before it'll be released. So it could be, a short time would be two to three weeks, but it could be there for a whole winter or a whole season. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's, it's an expensive endeavor when you've got something like that on hand because then you have to have food for it and the time and the energy and, and that to work with it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Does he have any intentions to open up another center in Ontario? Has that ever been considered? I don't think so. He's in his 70s. Yeah, he's yeah, not a young fella anymore. I think he would be really happy if he could find somebody to take over the one in Mount Bridges for him. And the, the person that runs the one out in Regina actually worked with Brian for many years, and then she moved out there with her partner and had enough skill and knowledge that she was able to open up with Brian's support, so which is which is great. There was actually an article on her a few years back. She had gone in and rescued a number of garter snakes that had gone into the basement of somebody's house. I think it was on CBC. And it was in the winter, fall, winter, when they were, the snakes were looking for somewhere to go. And um, so Megan went in and got them all out of these person's basement foundation and overwintered them. And then was able to release them again. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, as I said, there's some information and brochures up here. Thanks again for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk to you folks about salty Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lisa. That was incredibly.